So welcome everyone uh, to Author Meets Reader. My name is Sarah Everts and I'm a prof in the journalism department at Carleton University and I'm stepping in as a host for Jonathan Malloy. I'm pinch hitting because he's away. He normally MCs Author Meets Reader. Um, I would like to point out though that in terms of hosting, this place, this land, this space, it's actually um, not ours to host, um, but it's the, the peoples of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation, right? So Carleton University, um, my home, possibly yours, this pub, it's unseated and unsurrendered territory. So I do think it's like worth reflecting on this regularly and deeply. And I'm really glad that tonight we're gonna to be talking about decolonizing uh, an important part of our society, one that's close to my heart, namely journalism. But before we get to that, I have three housekeeping announcements. Um, the first is that uh, Author Meets Reader. Um, if this is your first time, it's a showcase from the Faculty of Public Affairs where folks who are researchers in our faculty from journalism, from law, from political science get to talk about their really cool research and it happens every last Thursday of the month. And so the next one is next Thursday on the auspicious day of February 29th. Um, that's number one. Number two, free food. Um, everybody's favorite topic, or at least mine. Um, there is a little white piece of paper on your table. We would like to offer you a complimentary snack. Um, so it's like an appetizer. If you want that, uh, just fill it out and give it to your server and they will take care of that. Thirdly, Octopus Books has a copy of this incredible book and uh, you can buy it at the end maybe get Duncan to um, sign it. And, um, oh wait, there's four things. Last, but really, really, really not least, um, the way things are gonna go this evening is there's gonna be a moderated conversation for about 45 minutes. Then you will have a chance to ask questions. So um, that will be in the latter part for about half an hour and things will wrap up at around seven, but you're welcome to stick around and chit chat um, thereafter. So now I have the best part, which is to introduce these two lovely people on stage. Very close to me is our moderator, who is Jorge Barrera. He is an award-winning journalist um, with CBC in the investigative unit. He's reported nationally, internationally, but we are super fortunate that he is based now in Ottawa. And then further afield um, is our esteemed author, uh, Duncan McHugh, um, whose voice and presence has been ubiquitous, uh, ubiquitous um, on CBC for decades. Um, he's been a host, uh, he's been a reporter, a correspondent on all sorts of programs. You've heard him on Cross Country Checkup, The National, The Current, um, and we are enormously chuffed that he joined Carleton University last year um, and is the professor of um, Indigenous journalism um, and storytelling. And we're going to be listening to him talk about his really interesting book called Decolonizing Journalism, a guide to reporting on Indigenous communities. And so um, I'm going to exit the stage so that these gentlemen can have a really interesting conversation. So let's welcome them. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. And, you know, Carl University's gain is, is CBC and, and Canada's law. Oh, my goodness. Wow. And, um, so, yeah, I know you guys are really lucky to have them. Um, and uh, it's great to be able to talk about your textbook and, you know, the whole issue of Canadian media's relationship with uh, Indigenous communities. And just to start... Oh, before you start, okay. Can I can I can I just say Ani Kinewaya, Uncle Don Sendejna Kas, Mayinga Nedo Dem, Chipwaza Georgina Island in Don Jipa, Anishinaabe in Dal, Us in Dal, Gwis in Dal, Injushquadet in Dal, Minwan Baskim in Dal, um Miigwech, uh, Ayayong, uh, Mompi, uh, Kinagwea, uh, 
Kitchinen nam wabmenakuk. Um, and and for those of you who uh, sorry to to, no, no, to, to jump in there, but 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 uh, for those of you who are rusty on your Nishnabim one, um, it, what I said was my name and my clan, uh, where I'm from, uh, in a traditional way that, that we greet ourselves amongst our people, and and you are you are a part of our our group here in our circle this evening, and so I wanted to greet you in the same way. Uh, I said that I'm a father, I'm a son, uh, I'm, a, I'm a partner, uh, and a hockey player too. Not a very good one, uh, but but uh, I'm just so happy that you you made the journey this evening. Uh, it's icy out there, uh, and so to share this time with you is very special to me and, and to Jorge as well. So thank you uh, so much for being here this evening. And that was a setup to show you how the differences in approaches to journalism and, and this whole issue of how you would approach something. It wasn't actually set up, it actually was, I was just going to start on, but you actually slowed it down, mm -hmm. right? And and spoke in your language and spoke about who you are and you welcomed people into the circle um, where our general approach to when we think of news just to go in there, sit down, stick the mic in it, let's say, mm. so like, how do you feel about the death in your, you know, yes. but this was a different, so I, so I think this goes and, oh, go ahead. Even outside you sound good. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm glad it brought you in. <laughs> um, well, is journalism, the structure, the way that we approach it, the way it's done, is that in itself intrinsically colonial? <sighs> wow, start off with the easy questions, Jorge. Holy cow, you're supposed to throw people a softball at the beginning. <laughs> well, it's uh, titled. <laughs> <laughs> so, Trist I'll tell you a story about the title of the book. Uh, Tristan Atone, who uh, is a good friend of mine, uh, was the president of the, the Native American Journalists Association, now the Indigenous Journalists Association. Uh, I interviewed him because I wanted to include different journalists' perspectives uh, on this question of decolonizing journalism. And so there's these wonderful interviews in the book with nine different journalists. Tristan is one of them, and at the end of the conversation, he says, why are you calling it decolonizing journalism, man? Like, like, what, what's with the title? And I said, well, what, you don't like the title? He says, we're not decolonizing journalism. He said, we're just doing some window dressing right now. He said, you know, we may be doing, seeking some equity and hiring in the newsrooms. Maybe we're trying to, to have a checklist when it comes to the content and the Indigenous content in our, in our lineups. He said, we're not talking about blowing up journalism right now. That's not what's happening with this reckoning. And he said, if you're really talking about decolonizing journalism, then maybe what, you're, what, what we should, the conversation we should be having is the way that uh, the, the indigenous people amongst ourselves have been truth tellers and, 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 and the way that, that our processes of storytelling and truth telling have, have served our communities. But that's not the conversation that we're having. We're having a conversation about how to, you know, include more indigenous people uh, in the news media, S says Tristan. But so so was the did did we have you know prior in in, in prior to contact did we have newspapers and six o'clock newscasts and all that kind of thing maybe not but we certainly had uh, storytelling uh, and and a process for truth telling uh, and and that was very much part of our community we had amongst the Nishnabek. Uh, you know, it is it is well known that we would have people who were selected uh, specifically to take the the important news to other communities, runners, messengers who would go to other communities, be accepted uh, as um, as messengers, honored and welcomed, where they would deliver the news of the Ogamuk, the chiefs to uh, to other leaders from other communities. So we had a process of journalism. Is, is that what we're talking about when we say decolonizing journalism? Maybe not, you know, returning to that form in this day and age? No, maybe not. But I, to, to answer Tristan's question, I believe that, that when 
uh, I speak with with Indigenous journalists like Brett Forrester, who's here. I'm so glad from CBC Indigenous here today. Uh, I know that you worked with the CBC Indigenous unit for so long. The work that Indigenous journalists are doing now is fundamentally changing the approach uh, of the Canadian news media and, and the journalism standards and practices as we know it today. And, and to just use a couple of examples, whether it is uh, the way that we approach communities, right? Like, so you talked about coming in and just sitting down and firing questions at somebody. In an, in an Indigenous setting, that may not be the best beginning approach. Uh, getting to know someone, building a relationship of trust takes time. Um, and so that's something that I see my Indigenous colleagues doing on a regular basis is saying to our, our senior editors, yeah, do we, I, I can't get this on the air by three o'clock because I'm going to do damage to the relationship with the community if I do that. I'm not saying that I, I can't file this at three. Of course I can. I'm saying that there's a lot, there's a way that we need to act when we, when we work with these communities. Um, or trauma-informed journalism. Uh, you know, uh, my colleague Matthew Pearson is here uh, from Carleton, and he has done incredible work with regard to trauma-informed journalism, but he's drawing on so much work that Indigenous journalists like Brandy Warren and uh, Connie Walker are doing in terms of teaching us how we should be cheap, uh, treating the subjects of our stories who experience trauma. So I think, I think that we are in fact, decolonizing journalism by, by bringing Indigenous cultural practices into the way that we envision storytelling and truth-telling in a contemporary, in 2023, as Indigenous peoples. In your, in your textbook, though, you spend a lot of some time providing advice on navigating the system and the structure, right? Yeah. You, you talk about, there's this one scene where a reporter is dispatched to community and the minister is supposed to make an announcement, but yep. there's like 20 minutes of speeches before the minister even gets to his announcement and what do you do? So you're actually, you know, your, your, your recommendations are how to work around and in spite of the structures and the system. Mm -hmm. It's n like the system isn't made for giving that space to letting a reporter go and make a relationship. So I'm just wondering, is the, the structure of the structure that is set up in a newsroom in, in and of itself is a hindrance to your, your average reporter in a newsroom has to cover the community uh, to actually making those relationships. Is, is there a structural problem with, with how journalism is, is currently done? Of course there is. And, and the deadlines are part of it. The deadlines are part of it, but but I don't know that that's necessarily um, the, the 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 clash of Indian time, as I refer to it in the book, and that's something that Indigenous people can say, but I don't advise non-Indigenous people to go around saying all the time. Uh, it, but but Indian time is real, and I do this in my class. I ask I ask stu you know students, uh, have you heard of Indian time? Uh, and and some of them put up their hands, but but then they also volunteer that, that there are things such as Jamaican time or island time or uh, Middle Eastern time. Uh, there are different cultural conceptions of time, um, which and, and those that clashes with newsroom for sure. Uh, and, and so, yes, the advice in the book is how to work around that as, as a journalist. But but the thing that, that I think goes through my head as you ask that question is that indigenous people are again in 2023 indigenous people are not like the rest of the country they want to know now <laughs> they want to know now if the forest fire is, is is encroaching upon the highway that they're trying to get out of they want to know now if you know someone has caught the fellow that is rampaging their community uh, with a knife um, they want to know now what the minister said about uh, the funding arrangements for housing. Um, so, so we're, we're caught in a, again. Indigenous people, we code switch. It's 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 necessary being a minority within your with within your own homeland. It's necessary that Indigenous people code switch uh, and and understand the the dominant culture and and the conception of time. And, and, and the world that we work within 
when I'm in the city of Ottawa showing up at Irene's pub may not be the same conception of time that I have when I go to the Medeon Lodge at Wiquimacom. Um, but, I, but I can operate uh, comfortably in both environments. And that's what I'm suggesting to, to journalists or any other uh, people who are working with communi Indigenous communities, whether it's in government policy or whether it's as a writer, is that you need to be able to adapt the the uh, the cultural expectations uh, of and I'm going to say just quotations the white man's world uh, with the community that you're working with the the indigenous community if that makes sense yeah and and, and like going through going through the the book and 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 you know the the advice you give and and I just given the context when this was happening. Like, you know, what's happened in the last couple of days, you have, you know, Tucker Carlson, yep. you know, drawing so many people and, and, and there's this whole discussion around a jur journalism and crisis. Mm -hmm. Is the approach to dealing with Indigenous communities, is that a way to help maybe change journalism to adapt to the times? Just, because people have more seem to have more willingness to sit through a YouTube video for an hour than we 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 thought in newsrooms in terms of attention spans. Well, I but that's what this is why I say that that, that those of us who are working in indigenous communities now and and trying to do so uh, in a way that shares shares the stories that have been so so long been silent and 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 untold, we're teaching the rest of the of of. of um, the folks in the newsroom, lessons that I think will would would help restore trust in journalism, and and w like people often ask me about this textbook, like okay, how, like boil it down. What's 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 the lesson that that I should learn about? And and I say it all boils down to one thing: uh, respect. You know, treat your story subjects with respect. Treat your story with respect, um, which is something that indigenous peoples unfortunately, have not been treated uh, with for so long in this country. Uh, there's a long line of, of people, you know, I may be a journalist just coming to seek a story and saying, how, you know, tell me your story. How does it feel being quite genuine? And when we hit a barrier, when we hit a wall, uh, many journalists get frustrated and say, ah, you know, this is, it's impossible to tell stories about these people or this community. Uh, but but there's a long, long history of outsiders coming into Indigenous communities and saying, you know, uh, I want to tell your story. I want to share your art. I want to study your people and then taking stuff away. Mm -hmm. and, and, and journalists are just the latest in a long line of that. And that's what we're experiencing when we go in and, and, and people, you know, put up that wall. Um, what what I am suggesting is that journalists need to act with respect. And, and so... When I tell people who are not journalists that, they say, well, shouldn't you be treating everybody with respect? And, and of course we should. Of course we should. But because of the way that the, the industry has evolved, the incredible pressure and timelines that we're on this 24-hour, 24-7 news cycle, um, we, we get into a scenario where we don't treat people with respect, where we, where we race into their lives, take away things and without, without really asking properly. Uh, that's, that's say that again, without really asking, asking properly. What properly. does that mean? What does that mean? Well, so we, we have journalism standards and practices about getting consent. No, I mean, I hope no, no journalist, uh, that, that is worth their salt in this country would, would go about duplicitously recording people. Uh, and, and putting them on the air, you know, but, but most most of my colleagues are are uh, are hardworking, ethical uh, people who who uh, who want to do good. You know, they, they they believe in the power of of journalism to to inform and educate and 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 make change. Most of my colleagues are like that. But the the standards and practices of that the, the have evolved in journalism. Uh, encourage us, encourage us to, to, to get consent in, in very simplistic ways that don't really necessarily consider the, 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 the longer game or how our actions may be impacting someone. 
And so, yes, I can do an interview on public property and take a picture of, of anybody that I can see as far as the eye can see. But, but um, well, we have the, the, uh, the ethic of minimizing harm, I think perhaps that is that is an ethic that we don't exercise with enough caution. <laughs> I think I think our bar for minimizing harm with regard to the stories that we tell is perhaps a little lower than most people would like, which is why people get so uncomfortable when a journalist shows up. Um, there's also, of course, the very and and you represent the finest tradition of this, the very important tradition of investigative journalism and 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 going. Uh, to dark places that, that other people would rather not see. And ever since Watergate, everybody wants to, to, to break the story that Deep Throat gave them, right? Mm -hmm. But not every story is that. But we all treat it. We all treat, uh, treat those news events of every day as, as if it's, it's us against them. Uh, it, that being the, the people that we're, 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 we're engaging with. When in fact, I think it would be better if we if we worked harder to build uh, relationships with the people that we're telling our stories about. If that if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, personally, after spending you know seven years at ADPTN Aboriginal People's Television Network, and Mark Blackburn was my boss there, and then with the CBC Indigenous Unit, and and actually applying the things that you discuss here in other communities, mm -hmm. um, a more, a more humble and patient type of journalism. Let me stop you there. Humble. I mean, how talk often, about that? Well. Humble. Wapakeja Grice talks about that. And when Wapakeja Grice told me that, I mean, I, that was the, 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 the heading of, of his chapter. Mm -hmm. I was like, how often do you hear the word humble in a newsroom? <laughs> Not very often. I mean, I mean, it is a place. And again, I love my colleagues, but but uh, there's a certain amount of ego involved when when you uh, you know put your byline on something, when you put your face on the air and start talking. You have to have a healthy amount of ego to say, "I have a story to tell, folks, and it's important." You know, s sit and listen. So I, everybody needs a healthy amount of ego, but but balancing that with humility, as Wapakiji Grice uh, shared with me in in the book. Mm -hmm. That's an important. That, that's that's an important Anishinaab lesson. That's one of our grandfather teachings amongst the the Anishinaabek. That's that, and that's why I say. I'm speaking from an Anishinaabek perspective here, perhaps not not the same one as my Haudenosaunee brothers and sisters, but 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 it, humility. To bring that into your work, into your practice, is to living the way that Gijimanado told us, the lessons that he has lived lived us, and taught us to live minimal lots and live a good life. I can bring that into my work and still be an effective journalist. And I just want to, we will get into this. I'll ask you specifically about the, you know, Canada newsrooms, indigenous coverage of indigenous cases, but I just want to get back to this, this issue because I've been, I've been thinking a lot about the loss, the erosion of trust that, mainstream in journalist institutions are facing you yeah. know, CBC. Yeah, you and everybody. Yeah. And and you know, what is the answer to that? What how what what how much of it is our fault as institutions, as journalists? And I think I think a lot of it is, is our is our fault. And going through this and, and and having I was just wondering, is there a roadmap here to reimagining what it means to be a journalist, more a slower, more patient type of... Process. So I'm so glad that you accepted the invitation to sit and talk with me because I, I wanted to have this conversation with you because you're so smart and, and, uh, and, and, and are asking these great questions. But I, I think it has been my experience that journalists are afraid that, that if we start to act with respect, if we start to act in humble ways, if, if, if we restore some of the consent, if the informed consent isn't just a one-off event, but it is a, something that lasts over a period of time and that a, a, a storytelling subject has an opportunity to actually pull out of a story after they've already agreed to do that. When you start to talk about these things with, with journalists, they get very fearful. And they say, how will we ever get news on the air? 
you know, how will we ever do those difficult investigative stories? Right? Are we just going to tell nice, fluffy PR stories about communities? But it has been my experience working with Indigenous communities that when it doesn't stop me, and it has, certainly hasn't stopped you from telling hard stories about communities, about hard truths, whether it is about uh, you know, what the, the, the human smuggling that you've so aptly reported on at Akwesasne, whether it is about uh, Indigenous women the, 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 the crisis of violence against Indigenous women in this country. When we go to our people and say, we need to tell these stories, they're ugly, they're not pretty, we need to tell these stories, and there may be bad guys within our midst who we need to expose. My experience has not been that people say, no, 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 you can't tell people that. No, no. You know, that's not been my experience. The first time that I ever did a, a quote, investigative story, uh, about uh, First Nation was a financial accountability. A guy dropped off a box of papers that I was not qualified to understand with numbers and, and, and many, many things. He said, our chief is so corrupt. He said, you got to do a story. And, and so I went to someone who was more qualified to understand it and said, yeah, that guy's pretty corrupt. And so we ended up doing a story and going and the... The, 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 the head of the community uh, said, you can't come. Uh, they, the, their lawyers uh, sent us a letter saying, you're not allowed on the reserve, uh, which is true. I mean, it, you, you know, uh, uh, an Indian reserve is private property, uh, so you can be fined for trespass, but there's a loophole. If you're invited in by a band member, then <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> you can actually go on there. Uh, but, but uh, you know, um, so, so all of these things. But when I finally filed that story, I, I was and I was a young cub reporter at that point. I thought, oh my god, uh, you know, I was sitting there, went to air, and I thought, and the phone started ringing, and I just thought, people are going to think I'm an apple, uh, I'm a traitor, I'm a turncoat, I'm 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 I'm, I, I'm I'm exposing all this dirty laundry of our own communities. And the first call was, hi, I'm from. X, Y, Z up in Northern BC, can you come to my community? And then I put it down and then the next call was, hi, I'm from the, in the interior of BC, can you come to my community? Hi, I'm from the coast, can you come to my community? I got call after call after call. Our people wanna know the truth. And, and just like, like other Canadians do, and that's why we turn to journalists. That's the expertise that we have, that process of fact verification. Uh, that process of, of evidence-based, you know, we're not fake news. That's what we're trying to fight back against. We need to let people, and, and, but our approach, our approach does us disservice. When the news trucks show up, you know, a lot of people run away because of the way that we have, we have uh, fashioned ourselves. Leading with the camera lens. Yeah, yeah, man. Like, like, like to the, again, Wabagizhik's advice as a VJ, as a cameraman, was there are times when I didn't turn the camera on. There are times when I pointed the camera at the ground to let people know that I'm not rolling right now. Let, like, help people understand that, that, there are, that we don't need to record everything all the time just because it's our right, our legal right to do so. Yes, it is our legal right to do so. We're not breaking any Canadian laws, but we may be, you know, we may be operating in a way that, that makes us very unpleasant. And just, just to stay on this theme a little more. Also, the, you know, the discussions around, you know, that that swear word, objectivity, the view from nowhere, <laughs> um, and and being conscious of what you don't know and your own biases, because you know you have with your students, you have these exercises. You know, if I you say the word and, and what what does this come to mind? You say this, what does it come to mind? So. So you, you, you challenge student journalists to, to look inward. Why should that just stop there? What, that is a process for all journalists in every single situation. I just think that's an interesting approach where you're, you're constantly checking your own bias. Mm -hmm. You know the view from nowhere doesn't exist. And I'm just wondering if there's this, what do you think of this This actually being conscious of that and, and being transparent about it. At the same time, there's also this demand out there where they think, oh, all journalists are biased. You can't believe them. 
So even though those same people, I think, would react positively to journalists being transparent because they seem to embrace those who are wearing on their sleeve. So I think there's a lot of lip service to editors saying, I don't believe in objectivity. Let's talk about impartiality. They, they use different words. Yeah. Right. But is there, do we need more soul searching, more introspection about exactly like, those concepts? So the whole notion of objectivity was completely misunderstood and, and, and misinterpreted and, and, and not to give a, a history lesson, but, but in brief, I mean, what, what the, the objectivity <clears throat> Uh, the, the word objectivity was adopted into American journalism, in particular in the early 1900s, as a way as a way to 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 try to give journalism a process. To say to say like the sciences that we have a method, we have a method for ensuring that we're telling you the truth, and it is this thing called objectivity. That that is that is where it evolved from. Um. <laughs> but I, ha I had a student come up to me just a couple days ago, and, and he said uh, to me, um, I'm thinking that I want to write a lot more like uh, Hunter S. Thompson. What do you, th what do you think of that? <laughs> and I said, right on. Uh, I can't write like Hunter S. Thompson. Can you? <laughs> um and, and good luck ingesting that m much, uh, you know, uh, narcotics and, and, and other, other because I'm still nursing my first beer here. Uh, I don't know that I could write like Hunter. I mean, Hunter S. Thompson, an incredibly talented writer, but I think the, I think the student's point was simply, uh, you know, asking me about that, you know, in the view from somewhere. Having a, whether, how to, to incorporate that into his reportage and storytelling. And I think it is incredibly important. Um, I worked on a podcast called uh, Cooper Island, which was an eight-part series about residential schools. It was very good. Thank you. Um, and we, I re, we rewrote the, the first episode, I'm not kidding you, 21 times. Uh, it was, I, at one point, I, th I, I thought uh, I, had, I had mucked up more horribly than ever in my career. I can hear my partner laughing because she 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 saw me at my lowest moments uh, during that time, but but the beginning uh, came in about uh, version nineteen, the opening lines of the podcast, because what I did was I injected myself in a way that I had never really done in any of my CBC journalism before, and the the opening lines of the podcast for those of you who haven't heard it is bonjour. Uh, Ankudance in Dijnakas, Anishinaabe Dabajimat in Dao. Hello, my name is Duncan McHugh and I'm an Indigenous journalist. Uh, and if Canada had its way, I wouldn't be here. That was the opening line of the podcast. And I can remember it because it came from here. Right? I don't go around memorizing my scripts, but I remember that because it came from here. And in a moment of desperation, I wrote what I really felt about why I was telling this story. And I, and, and, and I, I felt so nervous writing that, Jorge, because that's not CBC style, right? Uh, certainly not the style on the national. To, to declare with something as political as residential schools, you know, where, where I stand on that. But I couldn't remove that. I can't remove that from the way I see the world, you know, as, as someone who has extended family who went to the residential schools, who has had lovers and, and partners and, uh, you know, my children are, are intergenerational survivors, um, you know, I can't remove myself from the fact that, that the residential schools have colored the way that I see the world. Does that mean? that I'm biased? Does that mean that I'm prejudiced? Does that mean that the entire eight part series is, 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 is one-sided and, and, and uh, worthless? I hope not because Jody Martinson and, and Martha uh, Troyan and I did our utmost to go through a process of gathering the evidence that we needed to support the story that we ended up telling.
about one boy who died at a residential school. It's about, journalism is about fact-based verification, right? Uh, I think it helps a listener or a viewer or a reader understand where you're coming from as a storyteller if you declare, this is where I'm coming from, this is who I am, this is who I am. The first question that you get when you meet another indigenous person is, where are you from? That's the first thing that, that they'll ask you, where are you from? And what they want to know is not what city do you live in. They want to know who your relatives are. They want to know where you've lived. They want to know, they want to know who you are so that they can place you and, and understand whether or not they want to build a relationship with you. And so I think by letting our listeners and, and audiences know who we are, where we come from, then we are A, telling them that, that we know where we come from, and also that we've gone through a process of examining our own unconscious biases. I'm I'm a straight uh, I'm a straight male uh, and uh, cis and 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 I I have all kinds of built-in unconscious biases that have built up over years of growing up as a boy in in uh, in schoolyards playing in in hockey dressing rooms and all kinds of things that 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 color the way that that I I. Uh, you know, interview women or, or uh, perceive uh, uh, issue, LGBTQ issues as being newsworthy, all kinds of things. I need to, 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 to declare my own biases in, in, in many different ways to understand how I can do a better job when it comes to reporting on a wide variety, wide diversity of stories. Canada's national narrative has an unconscious bias, though, doesn't it? Sure. The idea, like this, this sort of ingrained sort of myth of the two solitudes, um, and I'm and it jumped that thought is sort of connected to what like Mark Trahan because he's with the Indian Country Today, and he talked about oh you know you can eat in Canada they seem to have more knowledge and in the United States and Native American issues aren't you know he was saying that somehow Canadians know more, but I find when you go in a classroom, you say, how many of you guys know about the Night of Long Knives? And everybody's going to like, and, and we just say, how many of you guys know about Gustafson Lake? And like maybe one person if you're lucky. So for knowing that, that journalists are starting at a deficit when, it's, when it comes to covering Indigenous communities, uh, the indigenous world within the borders of what we call Canada, mm. where should they start even before they pitch a story? So I, I think the easy place to start is, is in your own backyard. And so Sarah did a lovely uh, land acknowledgement. She didn't just read out the bump that's on the Carlton website. She gave a very uh, heartfelt and uh, uh, suggestion of what we need to remember every day that we're on Algonquin territory here, right? Um, and and I and I always suggest to journalists that they, they you need to know your own backyard. Like like, like do you know uh, you know what Mekon means, right? Why is it called Kitchissippi Mekon? Why why we, and yeah that's a news story, but do you know why it's called that, right? Um, things it, it's really important. Uh, so I have this course called Reporting in Indigenous Communities, which we just launched at the Carleton Journalism School. We have support from Pigwaknagan, Akwesasne, uh, Kitagon Zibi, and the Urban Indigenous Community to send our students out into those communities and report this, this term. And I'm really super excited about the course. Mike Mitchell, the former Grand Chief of Akwesasne for 33 years, uh, came and gave a guest lecture uh, this past Monday. I was so honored that he came to speak to our students. And, and Mike... You know, within about 15 minutes, Mike has taken the, the, the students, I'll call them kids, the students back to the 1700s. The, the 1700s, and he's holding up wampum they, they were earlier even, you know, and explaining the wampum to them and, and explaining to them. And these are, these are, you know, 19 to 23 year old uh, students who, who, who are here to learn about journalism in 2023. And, and it is so important that, that 
any journalist understands that there's a reason they don't know that history, that, that 1700s, 1800s, 1900s history. There's a reason why they don't know that history is because it was intentionally left out of Canada's contemporary history books because when that history is made invisible, it makes it a lot more comfortable for us to all sit here at Irene's pub and enjoy a beer on unceded land. When there's a gigantic billboard up at Kitagon Zibi talking about the, the, the young women and girls that have gone missing. When there is an opioid crisis at Pigwak Nagan. It is a lot easier to point our fingers and say, those problematic people, why can't they get their act together? Well, we sit here in comfort in a nice warm place in Ottawa and enjoy a drink and food. And I'm sorry to be a downer when you mention that kind of stuff, but that is the really important aspect of understanding your own backyard. And I don't think a lot of journalists know that history, and I don't blame them for that because it was intentional. Leave it out of the curriculum. Leave it out of the history books. History starts with Sir J.A.M. and goes on from there. Uh, and, and the joys of, of, a, of an iron horse going across the country. And, 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 uh, and there's this little tiny beginning, you know, where we built teepees and wigwams and all of those people were there. On that theme, how about the, the differences in terms of how history is viewed? As something that happened back then doesn't affect today in sort of your more mainstream Canadian world as opposed to history in say in in Denny land in Denny country hmm. where you know Treaty A signed in I think 1921 but I could be wrong anyways actually what happened in 1921 actually matters today mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about the, that difference in the sense of history as not being Back left behind, but actually still manifesting. Well, <clears throat> there, there's a, I guess there's a, and and here we're getting philosophical. Well, because Mike uh, Mitchell brought that wampum belt for a sure. reason. Of course, you go did. and go into Akasasne, and you, people talk, you know, and it's it's part of the political rhetoric of the day. I, I lived in James Bay uh, on the on the Quebec side uh, amongst the Cree. Uh, for, for a number of years uh, in my teenage years. And there was a phrase that, that there was a poster on the walls in, in, of, of James Bay EU school. And it said quite simply, um, without a history, we have no future. And I think, and, and I don't mean to oversimplify, but, 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 you know, the colonizer's mindset, of course, is necessarily looking future-focused and putting history away, right? There is no connection. And, and this, is, this is, you hear this amongst various Indigenous peoples about, about that period of contact, is that the colonizer, you know, uh, doesn't know where they come from. They, they don't know where they, they, they came from. They don't know who their people are, which is, which is a way of saying that they have forgotten that history. Right. And, and one may, I mean, I don't mean to get too, too, too grandiose about it, but, but, you know, when we look at the climate crisis that we're in right now, then, then perhaps it has something to do with the fact that, 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 that we have this inevitable, uh, not inevitable, this, this, this giant push forward all the time. The GDP always has to keep on growing. <laughs> right, uh, it, without a looking back, um, and and I and I don't mean to. Uh, Wabagiji Grice uh, is is a good friend of mine, and I'm going to toot his horn. By the way, if you want to read a great book, uh, Moon of the Crusted Snow, uh, please go out and get it. Uh, but I'm reading the the follow up right now, Moon of the Turning Leaves, and I was and and I was last night. I was lying in bed, and I was thinking. Uh, he talked about how. The group was making soap, and 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 I turned to Robin and I said, "My goodness, how do you make soap?" I, I had no idea, uh, and so we had a, lot, a really long conversation about about making soap. I mean, there there are things that that we have forgotten that are that are necessary and important things in in modern contemporary society, uh, which is leading us to the brink, quite frankly, 
And so again, you asked me, I, I hope that Indigenous journalists are teaching uh, contemporary journalists how to do journalism better. And I think uh, when I am with the traditional teachers uh, in a traditional setting, that they would like to think that the teachings that we, that we use in the lodge, uh, that, that we use in our ceremonies, are teachings that would help the world remember where they came from and, and the importance of history. I remember the first time I uh, I went to Atawapiskat, hmm. they were having an ice road blockade over, and this is this will be the wrapping up the us talking and then, um, and they were having an ice road blockade over uh, De Beers and lack of compensation for lost trap lines, and I spent like I don't know a couple of weeks there, Apichen. Uh, so let me let me stay up there and file from there. And one of the things, because my only perception about Awabaskat had been through the news, CBC, and uh, about poverty and and desolation and whatever. And when I got there, the thing that struck me was the fight in the community, like with with everybody. That there was there was fight there, and it, it surprised me. I was like, whoa, um, this is this could just catch fire. Mm -hmm. And, and I think it, um, Trahant, I don't know my saying. Mark Trahant. He yeah. also, Mark Trahant also spoke about resilience. Yes. How do you cover resilience? How do you extract, how do you show that? Like, is there, like, how do you look for it? Um, <clears throat> I think it's really important that, that, that we don't shy away from the difficult as aspects of, of our story as indigenous peoples. Uh, when I am, you know, we, we, we have uh, experienced the apocalypse uh, and, and, and our families are, are, are seeing the, 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 the after effects many generations later. And so all of us, when we, when, if, I, if I go to do a story uh, about missing and murdered Indigenous women, if I go to do a story about, uh, about a young girl uh, indigenous girl hockey player who is is now playing uh, in the NCAA. There's going to be, uh, you know, difficult truths about about uh, survivance, uh, which is which is necessary to appreciate the journey that they've been on to get to that place, right? But but I think the the the, the difficult thing uh, is, is, that, is that our trauma shouldn't be the lead, right? Uh, to, it, it, our, our trauma is part of our story, but it's not all of our story. And that Indigenous joy, Indigenous resilience, survivance is a huge part of our story. Uh, the fact that the seven grandfather teachings uh, still uh, have, have persisted, and I was listening to to uh, a story of Wenabojo last night in Anishinaabe one, and I thought to myself, it is absolutely remarkable that I'm on a Zoom call with all these Anishinaabe from all over the Great Lakes region, listening to a winter story about Wenabojo sticking his ass up to fart at a duck. You know, like like that. That, that my ancestors are very happy right now, you know, uh, and and I and I thought to myself, the fact that that we uh, are still here is one thing, but 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 not only that, that we're carrying forward these incredible traditions that we were gifted from our ancestors, whether it is the seven grandfather teachings or our or our storytelling or our craft work, uh, you know, the, the innovations that we have brought the world, such as the, the, the maple syrup that I poured on my French toast this morning, uh, or the birch bark canoe or things like all of these things that we have brought to, to, uh, to Canadians and, and the world. Those are all things to celebrate. And, and, uh, you know, I think maybe we should get uh, some red baseball hats, uh, and 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 said, you know, make uh, make Indigenous people great again, make Anishinaabe great again, uh, because that I think is what what when you ask about resilience, we've gone through this incredible period of low, but it's only a very short period in the history of our peoples, and where we are, there is no question in my mind, we are we are going 
coming back again. And that is the prophecy of the seven generations, that the seventh generation would come back and relight that fire again. That's what's happening right now amongst our people. That's what's happening amongst the youth. They are growing up to uh, make Anishinaabek or Mi'kmaq or Haida or Dene great again. Because though our ancestors were great, they survived incredible trials and tribulations that you and I, like, do you know how to make soap, dude? Like, I don't know how to make soap. I don't know. So, so um, you know, we're, 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 we're heading in that direction. And resilience is a massive part of our story. I make soap at Sharper's Drug Murder. <laughs> <laughs> I open the book. <laughs> um, all right, let's uh, open up to questions. Microphone right there. I'm thinking about the after a story has dropped. I'm thinking about the Buffy St. Marie story. Are there lessons learned about how to, I mean, how to deal with a story that is going to have a huge repercussion um, in indigenous communities? What, are there any lessons learned for doing follow-ups for, for, for how to handle that? So I'm not, I, I have to think about the Buffy thing for a moment. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> yeah, but but let me tell you. I'll, I'll tell you a story about my own my own. That's uh, an example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so it is a good example. I'm not, I'm not dodging it. I just need to think about it for a second. Um, when about five six years ago, do you remember? Do folks remember La Loche, uh, a community up in northern Saskatchewan where there was a, a school shooting? School shootings, fortunately, in Canada are, are, are relatively rare compared to our southern neighbors. So in and of itself, it was newsworthy. Um, and, but the fact that it was in an, an indigenous community made it a little bit more unusual even. So they asked me to go to La Loche. Um, and uh, a young boy had, had uh, taken a shotgun into the school. And, um, and I believe there were three people kill you you'll have to quote my my, my <laughs> i blocked part of it from my memory apparently uh I'm, I'm hazy on the facts but there were three or four people killed uh the community was absolutely devastated um and the first day or two of coverage was what i would call typical uh tragedy coverage uh, it was national news, so there were there were uh, live trucks lining the streets of this small community. Uh, reporters from every outlet imaginable, uh, including from the states. But on day three, uh, I, be I believe it was either the Globe or the Times, one of the prominent papers. Uh, the headline was Laloche, a community with with no hope. Um, and, and there's no doubt that uh, Lalosh has had a series of uh, suicide crises over the years, which have made living there very difficult. Uh, there's a long history with the church and residential schools. But when that headline broke and there were a number of stories that had similar uh, types of, of angles or slants, the community mood changed completely from being welcoming that their pain uh, and tragedy was being shared to get the hell out of here. Get the hell out of here. You are violating us as a people. Uh, and we all needed to stay. Um, but to, to, to continue reporting on that, that very difficult story, but it as an Indigenous journalist, to be told by people uh, it, that they didn't want me there, that I had no uh, access, that I, that, that, that I, was, uh, I was doing harm, that was incredibly difficult for me. Uh, and I left Lalash saying, I will never put myself in that, that same scenario again, ever. Uh, I, this is not how I want to report on the news. The reason I'm, I'm answering, the, telling you that story is simply that uh, several years later, uh, the James Smith Cree Nation 
had a similar type of tragedy. And I think I can say safely that the way that that was approached by the CBC and other media outlets has changed considerably. So when the James Smith Cree Nation, and, and for those of you who don't remember, there was a, a man who was on a rampage with a knife in the community and, and, and tragically killed a number of them. When that news broke, the James Smith Cree Nation said no media and put up a line and enforced that right that they have that this is, they, that outsiders cannot trespass on Indian reserve land. Um, and most of the media, in fact, most of the, of the, of the credible and legitimate media in this country, uh, honored that for days until they stood on the outskirts of the community, reported the news as best as they could, but they did not go into the community until the community had done the work that it needed to do to be able to present a public face forward and then held a community news conference. That's very different than having 400 reporters traipsing around a community, sticking microphones in everybody's face and saying, "What? how do you feel? <laughs> um, and, and does that mean that we didn't report the news? No, we reported the news. We gave the updates as best as we could from the outskirts to people who wanted to speak with us. Um, and then when the community felt that it was ready to, uh, three or four days after this awful thing happened, come and give a public face to that. Then we then we began to consume more. I think we're learning. I think we're getting better. I think because of the uh, because of some of the the you know the debriefs that we've done about what's gone wrong in our relationships with indigenous communities that we are getting better. And that's not just the CBC thing. I mean, I think all the outlets respected that, partly because it's the law, but but I think it was a it was an ethical choice on the heart of all the outlets to say, okay, that's very unusual. That's that's not that's not typical. But the truth of the matter is is that you don't necessarily need to have cameras in the face of people twelve hours after it's happened. Maybe just give them a day or two to grieve. Yes, in the back there. Um, you talked a little bit about building trust. And as a journalism student, I'm at that weird place where I'm learning to tell stories, but also relearning history because high school did not do a good job of teaching indigenous history. And so how do I, who's not an indigenous person um but wants to do stories or wants to reach out to indigenous people even for stories that are like about evie um i often have trouble writing those emails but also there's like very often like i don't get a reply back how do i build that trust like if you have any practical advice um so what's let me ask you this what's your thing what 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 do you, do you have hobbies do you have do you have uh likes or joys in your life i love reading books you love reading books okay so my first suggestion is to you is there are so many amazing indigenous authors out there who i would just be able to like have them piled high go to the library you don't need to you don't need to pay you can get my book at the library, by the way. Don't do, don't tell Octopus that. But students, you can get my my book at the library. Okay, everybody else who's not a student, you can get my book at Octopus at the back there. Uh, but but students, you're allowed to get it from the library. Um, but but Pilot High and and some of my favorites: Wabagisha Grice, Sherman Alexi, uh, Louise Erdrich, uh, Richard Van Camp. Like, like the, I just, I could go on and on and on. Please shout out other indigenous authors, Thompson Highway. Uh, there are so many of them. Read, read. If that's your joy, if your joy is music, then start, just Google indigenous into Spotify, right? Just, just pop it in there and start building a playlist of, of, of great indigenous artists. Red Bone, and Robbie Robertson, and Tanya Takah, and, and just like all kinds of, listen to it on the bus. And that has nothing to do with getting an interview in journalism. Uh, but you know what? When you start doing that, you're going to have a reference point for what you're going to do next, which is not send an email, 
but try to uh, go in person to the places that you are uh, hoping to report on. So we had a fantastic round dance on Saturday night at Carleton, uh, where the people gathered for for winter ceremonies, if you will, a ver Carleton's version of Indigenous winter ceremonies. When you go to a place like that, just because you're curious, which is the thing that we can't teach you at journalism school, when you go to a place like that, just saying, geez, I hope I find a story somewhere, and someone is wearing a Redbone t-shirt, and you say, ah, oh, Redbone, come and get your love. I love that song, man. Or there's someone who is selling a stack of books uh, that, and you know that, that uh, you can talk about the Reese Erdrich or whatever it may be. Then you're going to make a connection to people that they will, they will just be fascinated to sit and talk with you. Whatever your passion is, whether it's gardening or whether it's fishing or whatever, us Indigenous people, we do it too. Find, find the Indigenous people that, that you can follow on Facebook or on Instagram and just include them in your timeline a little bit. And then you'll start to get to know a little bit about us, and about our people and about our culture. And that's going to help you more than any email will will ever do because then you're going to connect to those people that you're trying to ask for an interview. Thank you. Does that help? Yeah. Good. There's another question here. Uh, hello everyone and Ani Duncan. Ani. Again. Um, my name is Yelda Sower. I'm a former journalism student, current journalism club as you said. <laughs> I think I'm getting too close. Um, I come from uh, Newmarket, Ontario, uh, Toronto, and now I'm here on Algonquin land. I'm so thrilled to be here. I meant to say this uh, to you individually, but um, I think tonight and meeting you has, is and remains to be one of the greatest honors of my life. So thank you for tonight. Um, in addition to the wisdom and the guides or guidelines that you have on the book and what you shared with me privately and what you've shared with everybody right now, um, as a person of color and journalist of color, what would you say my approach should be to indigenous stories? Is there anything distinct considering my background, where and what I come from, um, that I could particularly implement into um, my reporting of possible um, indigenous stories? Because, um, you know, considering my heart and my passion for the business for, for the line of work um i will be traveling uh, a lot and i will be going to indigenous territories um not just because uh, some say i should but because i would like to uh no matter what happens along the way no matter how long it takes i would like to go and so if there's any particular um lesson message or guidance that you could give me it would mean the world to your question. And, and so can you say your name for me again? Because I don't want to I don't want to mispronounce it. Yelda. Yelda? Yeah. Yeah, Yelda. So Yelda, I don't need to explain colonialism to you. I don't need I don't need to explain colonialism to you. So uh, that that is something that you bring to your journalism as a person of color, uh, with from in the Afghani diaspora um, that is an incredible value when it comes to reporting in indigenous communities. You already understand colonialism and you already understand some of the challenges and trials and tribulations of the people that you'll be reporting on. Um, what I get international students in, in my reporting in Indigenous communities class on a regular basis who say, I don't know anything about Indigenous people in Canada. I don't, I'm just still trying to figure out OC Transpo and, uh, you know, like, well, how, how am I, how am I going to pass this course? Um, but, but the, every, because, because internationally there has been a, also a storyline, a narrative about the red man. You know, and 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 how Indians are perceived by people in Afghanistan, in in the Caribbean, in Germany, um, that 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 international students or immigrants have to have to 
learn <laughs> uh, when they when they get here. Um, but being, uh, I, I guess, there's a fear factor there that because you are not Canadian, uh, and I, I don't know if if you are or not, but but uh, this is for my international students because they're not Canadian that they don't have a legitimate. Uh, they don't have a right to tell that kind of story. But the truth of the matter is, is that most Canadians don't know that history either. Most Canadians don't have that knowledge base either. Most Canadians are also full of all kinds of stereotypes about Indigenous people because of the way that all of us have grown up. Indigenous and non-Indigenous people consuming pop media culture full of those tropes. So just because you didn't... Uh, necessarily grow up learning the history, Canadian history, uh, doesn't disqualify you uh, from taking it on now and rising not only to the bar, but high above the bar. And frankly, the bar is relatively low uh, in terms of the, the, the cultural competency and the knowledge base that you need to operate in the community. I see. That doesn't answer, that doesn't answer the question. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. I can hear you, Christopher. Go ahead. Christopher Waddell, the, the former head of the Carlton Journalism School. On the, on the one hand, you talk very eloquently about the need to spend time in communities, when you're going into communities mm. to build relationships uh, that improves the ability to do the reporting you want to do. Uh, we're also dealing with an industry that's increasingly putting more and more pressure on journalists to do more and more to the point that they're quitting and they're deciding they don't want to do it anymore. Yes. We're also talking about an industry that's eliminated all, in many cases, the beat reporters. So the person who goes to do a story on one day may not be the same person who goes to do a story the next day, and someone else at the side. Is there a meeting point between those two different worlds? And if so, where is it? So I know that you're asking that question as someone who started up JSource, which, which for those of you who don't know, uh, you know, is, is a... a a dialogue amongst journalists about how do we do journalism better and and you know are we in crisis yes is journalism broken yeah it, it is the, the financial model for journalism is broken um, and and there are lots of factors for that but but what does that mean for those of us who are in the newsrooms right now and having to 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 uh produce it means do more with less that that's that's the the unfortunate uh reality of of journalism but but jorge was asking about about what can we teach you know, in, when, when we talk about Indigenous journalism and, and, and Indigenous journalists, what can we teach the newsrooms? I think I'll give wellness. You know, like, like the whole notion that, that, that so many Indigenous people have had to, to, to return to, rediscover, or continue to nurture, uh, the, the notion of balance. Uh, of, of wellness, of healing, these are all things that, that, that we should be bringing into our work. Uh, and perhaps that's a lesson. So when, when you ask for a wellness, when I came back from the Lalash and said I needed at least two or three mental health days, uh, you know, as a result of what I experienced, um, those are important uh, practices that, 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 that the newsrooms need to start respecting. And, and so it, it is not healthy. And people will, uh, I have young students on a regular basis who grab that, that uh, and, and I see some of them here right now. The lights, I swear I didn't see you guys. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, who, who get that job at CBC or the Globe or whatever it may be, and they're gone after a year because it's it's just relentless. And 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 it, it, it we can't they talk about who's teaching who, right? Matthew knows this. 
uh, Matthew who teaches trauma-informed journalism, this younger generation is teaching the older generation that suck it up buttercup, that's not a good approach. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a good approach. And I am trying to find a balance. Taylor and I have some marking that is due uh, in the next couple of days. And if she doesn't have it due, I'm going to be like, you know, sending her an email. But that said, you know, uh, we need to understand that, um, that, that we can't expect every journalist to do, uh, to do file radio TV, online, do rants, social media, all between, you know, nine to five. Did you have to do that today? Did you have to do that today, Brett? I mean, I mean, no. I do that on stories. But I just want to just yeah, jump quick, in, please quickly say, say there is no, there is no meeting point, right? There is, it, it just doesn't work. And it's, it's driving, it's, it's eroding our credibility. It's eroding our reach. Having journalists do more is is a recipe for for doom. So no, there is. I don't think there is because we get it wrong as well. Like 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 that's that's part of it too. And 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 when we are filing in multiple formats like that, it's it's harder to to go through the fact checking process. I know that we talk about small startups like the Narwhal, for example. Right. For those of you who don't know the Narwhal, the Narwhal is an excellent. Um, uh, outlet from the West Coast that focuses on environmental reporting and deep reporting. Mm -hmm. And I think that there are, uh, again, it's, it's just one small model, but, but it's a way of showing us that our audiences want context, they want long-form journalism, they want factual reporting, not just those daily hits. Uh, that there is an appetite for that, that, that there are ways that they will you know, we've let the genie out of the bottle. People expect free journalism, but they're also willing to pay for it. And trying to find the way is, is that's that's going to be our our struggle as as an industry. Yeah, but people are always going to want news. That that's that's the other thing too. Like like people wring their hands that journalism is dying. Nobody, we're never going to stop wanting news. It's 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 part of the. You, you sit down and sit to someone on on the bus or somebody you haven't seen for a long time you say what's new uh, it's just a human it's a human thing and so there's going to be a point where people are going to i mean i'm not i'm not a soothsayer i can't tell you what what the future holds for our relationship with social media right now but but i think that people may be starting to turn to against <laughs> the 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 addictive beast that 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 facebook and other other uh other social media outlets have, have created uh and they're going to start to get to a point where they will say i hope i, I can only hope that they will say i i want i will pay for a storyteller and a trusted storyteller to tell me the news i get in the way that they used to can i ask duncan one more question or, or is, is there more? Absolutely, you can uh, follow up. Yeah. yeah. Uh, last question, uh, the moderator is... Okay. Can you, can you talk about the process and the uh, and the story of, of how you told the, the Marlene Bird story? Yeah. Can you talk about that? Is that... I, I mean, because I, I actually... I actually thought that that was a model that we should follow in storytelling. Can you talk about that? So, uh, for those of you that don't know, Marlene Bird, <clears throat> um, Marlene was uh, a homeless woman in, in northern Saskatchewan who uh, was set on fire and uh, lost her legs. Um, and it was awful. And uh, in the way that, that you can't help but watch uh, when you drive past a car accident, uh, people across the country wanted to know a little more about how that could happen. 
I was a reporter in BC at the time, and so I wasn't sent off to cover that as a news story, but I read the news like everybody else. And, and after Marlene survived, lost her legs. And after a little while, uh, Marlene fell out of the news. Uh, and so about six months after, um, I got in touch with one of Marlene's relatives and reached out and uh, uh, who connected me with Marlene because I wanted to know how Marlene was doing. Um, and it turned out she wasn't doing so well. And, um, and so I asked uh, for the Marlene's number and I phoned uh, a couple of times, no answer, no answer, no answer, back burner. Finally got an answer, and this Cree guy answers, Patrick, Patrick. And he's like, oh, Marlene, you know, Marlene's just out of whatever, and, and, uh, and, and was just really full of piss and vinegar, Patrick was. Uh, and he was telling me all these stories, and, and he says, oh, hang on, I'll get, I'll get her, I'll get her. Anyway, Patrick was uh, Marlene's partner. And Patrick operated the cell phone a lot better than Marlene did. So every time I would phone Marlene, uh, Patrick would answer, and, and I could hear the banter back and forth between the two of them. Uh, and over a course of time, I built up this relationship over the phone uh, with Marlene, where she wanted me to come to Saskatchewan to tell her story. But in the process of that, I realized that... Uh, it was as much Patrick's story as it was Marlene's story. And despite the awful things that happened to her, and despite the fact, uh, you know, she was, she, she was essentially booted out of the hotel or at uh, the hospital in, uh, I'm going to say Saskatoon, but it could be wrong. It might be Regina. Um, you know, and, and, set back up to Prince Albert with no wheelchair and, and, and with a drinking problem and all kinds of other things. Despite all of those awful things, Marlene, talk about resilience. I mean, there's a woman that personified resilience. Um, but it was as much Patrick and Marlene's story because Patrick became, who was also homeless and also an alcoholic, became very much her support person. And I also remember the first line of that story as well. And it was this awful, awful story about a woman who lost her legs in a fire and was set on fire uh, intentionally. But the first line in the story was, this is a love story. And that was very much the way I tried to shape that. Because for Marlene, that awful event led to something beautiful, which was that the relationship between these two homeless people became stronger than anything that they had ever experienced before. And it was very much a love story. Um, so it was a challenging story because Marlene was drunk half the time that I was there and she agreed to let us show that. Uh, that was the way that she had been taught to cope from the abuse that she'd suffered as a woman, the residential school trauma that she'd experienced, and, many, and of course the, the, the awful thing that happened to her. But Marlene and Patrick laughed. They laughed and they had joy, and it was important to, to share that with people. And, and, and so I was nervous when that story went to air because, you know, Marlene is driving around downtown Prince Albert on drunk and lay on her, on her wheelchair and we're putting it on national television. Uh, but, but, uh, you know, it, it was very much looking at Patrick and, and, and Marlene and I phoned Marlene after it ran and, uh, and, and she I said, how did, how did, what was it like? She said, oh, Duncan, I went to downtown and she said, people were asking me if I wanted donuts and they were buying me coffee and she was so happy. And um, So, yeah, it was, it was a love story. <laughs> Thank you for asking. Thank you.
Thank you for telling that story. And thank you for for being here and for writing this book. And Jorge, thank you for asking such really beautiful and insightful questions. Um, and thank you all for listening and asking questions too. Um, I'd like to wrap up with two little things. One, if you are inspired to buy the book, Octopus Book is in the back. Students, you are not allowed. Um, and if you'd like to join us in a month, uh, Susan Bradley and Pat Armstrong are going to be talking about care homes, long-term long -term care homes in a turbulent era, and, and whether they have a future. So that will be on February 29th. In the meantime, I'd really love to give these guys uh, a thank you and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Good night, everybody.